during the summer months here at Christ Lutheran, we're going to be spending some time looking together at portions of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. This letter is some of Paul's best and densest work. Unlike other letters that he wrote to other churches, this particular letter goes to a church that he's never met, but one that he hopes to visit soon. Like every church, this church has its share of troubles and disagreements, and we'll look at some of those as the summer progresses. But here, at the beginning of Romans, Paul spends the first four chapters reminding these people that none of them have anything to brag about when it comes to their faith. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. None of us has earned our way into God's good favor. As we say often together in the words of confession, we have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. But of course, it wouldn't be good news if that's where the story stopped. Paul goes on to tell the church in Rome that God has been up to incredible things in spite of human sin and brokenness. He says that because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, that you and I have peace with God. This peace comes not because we've earned it, or inherited it, or said the right prayers, or attended the right church services. The peace that God gives comes to us as a free gift of grace. And then Paul does this odd thing. The very people that he told twice in the last two chapters that they should not be boasting, he tells them that it's okay to boast in one particular circumstance. They're allowed to boast when it comes to their sufferings. Now that may seem like an odd thing to boast about. I don't know anybody who enjoys suffering. Isn't that, it's not the kind of thing that most of us would seek out. In fact, we often go to incredible lengths in order to avoid it. And yet, here is one of the greatest missionaries the church has ever had, telling the people of Rome that they can boast in their sufferings. Here's why. Paul trusts that God is able to overcome suffering and to redeem it. Notice here that I didn't say that God's, God caused the suffering, but that God has a way of taking the pain and suffering that we experience that seems senseless and futile and brings out of it some measure of life or hope or meaning. That's why he goes on to write one of the most famous passages in Scripture, saying that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. As I think back over my own life, the people who I've known who just seem to be overflowing with joy are not people whose lives have been easy. In fact, it's usually just the opposite. The ones who have this deep, irrepressible joy are almost always the ones who have been through incredible suffering or hardship. Uh, there may not be no better examples than those of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. As Archbishop Tutu led the charge for an end to apartheid in South Africa, he heard the incredibly painful stories that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I can only imagine the kind of mental and physical and spiritual toll that must have taken to be meaningfully present in that place. And the Dalai Lama is a man who has been exiled from his land and his people since 1959. These men, like the Apostle Paul, have known great suffering. And yet over and over again, the thing that people notice when they encounter this unusual pairing is that they're overflowing with joy. 
This joy doesn't minimize what they went through by any means, but it gives them the endurance and the character to persevere in spite of it. They seem to be living, breathing echoes of Paul's own theology about pain and suffering. That it isn't something to be sought, and it isn't something to be inflicted on others, but that God has a way of transforming pain and suffering into unquenchable joy. The image that comes to mind for me are of those times in the pool in the summer when you take a beach ball and you push it down below the surface of the water. You could push it down as deep as you wanted, and if you were particularly stable, you might be able to push it down and actually get it underneath your feet so that it's down on the very floor of the pool. But sooner or later, the ball would come rocketing back up, not just to the surface of the water, but often high into the air. We can boast in suffering because we trust that God redeems and brings meaning out of suffering. I think about the difficulty that many of us have encountered as this world came to an abrupt stop in an effort to flatten the curve and to slow the spread of the coronavirus. This virus and its fallout have brought great suffering to so many people and places. We know that we're going to be dealing with the lingering effects of it for a long, long time. And yet, we've seen good come out of it as well. So many people have shared with me about how they've enjoyed being able to spend extra time with family or maybe being able to skip the hectic daily commute to or from the office. Or maybe how they found extra time for walking outside or tending a garden or developing some new skill or hobby. Even the church, which hasn't been known for being on the cutting edge of technology, has taken a giant leap forward and now worships and studies and cares for one another through new technological means that none of us were doing even just a couple months before. And so, my dear friends, take heart. Not only does God in Christ stand with us in the midst of our sufferings, but that same God is diligently at work, bringing life and hope and meaning out of those sufferings. Because suffering produces character, and character produces hope, and hope, hope does not disappoint. And so may you know the peace and joy that passes all understanding. May God redeem your suffering and fill you with hope that does not disappoint. And may Jesus, the one who died for our sake, walk with you every step of the way. Amen.